The God of War franchise has a sprawling timeline that interweaves its great Greek tragedy across nine games and two wildly distinct mythologies. And while I'd love to say it's a relatively simple chronology to untangle, the point is, it's not, hence why I'm making this video. And with God of War Ragnarok set to further slide the franchise's anti-hero Kratos into the mythological mire, what better time to dive back into the Ghost of Sparta's saga of gods and monsters? Hey, my name's Adam, this is my big old board of gods and titans that likely won't see the end of this video, and this is the God of War timeline fully explained. Our timeline kicks off with a healthy stab of backstory courtesy of the monochrome flashbacks from God of War Ghost of Sparta. Here we catch up with Kratos spending some quality time with the family, and back in the day that meant kicking the everlasting crap out of your brother. Side note, watching this back you might assume that this fella here is Kratos because of, well, the distinctive red markings. But you would be wrong dear viewer, this lad here is Deimos, Kratos' brother and perhaps the main catalyst for our anti-hero's violent journey through Greek and Norse mythology. You see, these flashbacks showcase the two brothers training to become Spartan warriors, only their sparring is cut short by the untimely arrival of a pair of Greek gods, Ares the god of war and Athena the god of wisdom. They're here on Olympus business taking care of a little prophecy that predicts the downfall of Zeus and co. Turns out that the end of the Greek gods will come at the hands of a marked mortal, and Ares and Athena zero in on Deimos and his distinctive birthmarks. They nab the tiny Spartan lad and begin to make their exit, only for our good pal Kratos to stand in their way. For his insolence, Ares straight up sucker punches him in the face, leaving a nasty scar over his eye. And if it weren't for the mercy of Athena, Ares would have killed Kratos right there and then, a decision that ironically seals the God of War's fate later on. And in his brother's honour, Kratos tattoos himself in the image of his brother's scars, which, you know, might just mean that prophecy is back on the cards. Through flashbacks interwoven into the story of the original God of War, we learn that Kratos becomes a captain in the Spartan army, in charge of a horde of rampaging murderous soldiers, and Kratos himself has become something of a bloodthirsty, power-hungry warlord, ever pushing to extend the boundaries of the Spartan Empire. To the disdain of his family, Kratos pursues his bloodlust until he meets his match in the form of a mammoth barbarian army. He blindly charges right on into the fray, and to be honest, it doesn't go all that well. Facing certain defeat, he calls upon the God of War Ares, must have forgotten that encounter with his brother, eh? To help him defeat his enemies and push for victory. Ares, being the self-serving bastard that he is, agrees on the condition that Kratos swear loyalty to him. And Kratos, caught in an extremely desperate moment, signs on the metaphorical dotted line and the deal is sealed, as the iconic Blades of Chaos are chained to Kratos' arms. Once attached, the chains remained so, chained and seared to the flesh, a part of the bearer's body, a permanent reminder of Kratos' pledge. And from that moment on, Kratos wages war on behalf of Ares, striking down all foes in his path at the whim of the God of War. This relentless warpath eventually leads him to a village occupied by worshippers of Athena. Kratos hacks and slashes his way through the villagers, blindly murdering them left, right and centre, but unbeknownst to Kratos is the fact that Ares has led the Spartan captain right into a trap. In his blind rampage, Kratos kills his own wife and daughter, and in that horrific moment he snaps out of his bloodthirsty rampage. The image of his two final victims would stay with him for all his days. Ares believes that this key act would turn Kratos into the perfect warrior, but instead Kratos renounces Ares and vows to get revenge on the god of war. As he mourns his wife and child, the oracle of the destroyed village curses Kratos and fuses the ashes of his dead family to his body, turning his skin pale white and branding him as the ghost of Sparta. Damn this franchise is cold. With his oath to Ares broken, Kratos becomes a marked man, in more ways than one. God of War Ascension sees our tormented Spartan hunted down by the three Furies for breaking his oath to a god. This ancient retelling of classic 90s action of the Fugitive, which is possibly a connection I've made just because I watched that recently, sees Kratos team up with a man named Orcos, who we learn is the son of Ares and Electo, one of the Furies. Far from the perfect warrior Ares was hoping for, Orcos is cast aside and takes up the role of the Furies Oathkeeper. 
While the main narrative is quite slight and really just a warm-up for the inevitable Kratos versus the Furies fight, we do learn a few new facts about Kratos' bond to Ares. For starters, Ascension reveals the reason behind Ares' desire to control Kratos. Ares molded you to take down the very walls of Olympus. You see, it turns out that Zeus has forbidden the gods from waging war on one another, and as a result, this rule bars Ares from seizing power on Mount Olympus. Ares' way of getting around this is to groom the ultimate warrior with three tests that would bind said warrior to his demands. And one of these tests turned out to be Kratos' unwitting murder of his family. Either way, back to God of War Ascension's main plot, long story short, Kratos kills the Furies. <laughs> Oh, you were expecting more? Um... Well, poor old Orcos also doesn't make it past the credits of Ascension. The unlucky lad is still the Fury's Oathkeeper, including Kratos' oath to Ares, and with him still alive, Kratos will never be able to take revenge on the God of War. Orcos literally begs for death from Kratos, claiming it will bring them both release from the tyranny of Ares. Kratos reluctantly obliges and puts the Oathkeeper out of his misery, thus setting in motion his path towards redemption. With the death of Orcos, the blood oath to Ares was finally broken. While his bond to Ares might have been broken, Kratos is still very much in debt to the rest of the gods, and that's where we catch up with him in the PSP adventure Chains of Olympus. About five years into his servitude, Kratos is kicking up a storm in the city of Attica, where he offs both the Persian king and a big f off basilisk. As he's starting to feel too old for all this god shite, Kratos spies the sun vanishing from the sky, leaving the world in total darkness. Not content with simply calling this nighttime, Kratos investigates and discovers that Helios, the god of the sun, has been kidnapped, allowing his sneaky colleague Morpheus, the god of dreams, to slide on into Olympus and put the gods into a deep, cosy sleep. Kratos traces the whereabouts of Helios to the underworld by using his steeds, the horses that carry the sun chariot across the sky. Down in the underworld, Kratos discovers that the titan Atlas has escaped from his chains, which is odd because he's bloody massive. But even more intriguing for Kratos is that he encounters visions of his daughter Calliope. Naturally, this vision is too good to be true, and is a test of Kratos' will created by Persephone, goddess of the underworld and the embittered wife of Hades. Kratos once again falls right into the trap, and is reunited with his daughter on the fields of Elysium. Calliope! Father? My oh. child. Why did you go? I am here now, child. And it's here where, surprise surprise, Persephone reveals that it was her plan to kidnap Helios, alongside the escaped Atlas, in a bid to get back at the gods for trapping her down in the land of the dead. Kratos then coldly turns his back on his daughter in surely one of the most bizarre uses of a quick time event in all of gaming. Father, please! All in service of his pursuit of the goddess of the underworld. Kratos eventually catches up to Persephone, brutally murdering her and putting a stop to her plans to seize power in Olympus, which is already establishing itself as a solid motive for this franchise's antagonists. Which marks the first time I get to use this flashy board. Good riddance. He then escapes the underworld aboard Helios' steeds, and absolutely exhausted from the efforts of his adventures in the land of the dead, falls from the chariot. He's rescued from certain death by the reawakened gods Athena and Helios, who leave him dozing on a cliffside overlooking the Aegean Sea. All of which finally lands us at the very first God of War game. Set a decade into Kratos' servitude to the gods of Olympus, the original God of War kicks off in suitably epic fashion. Absolutely exhausted at the relentlessness of his deeds across the last decade, Kratos seeks out Athena in search of a get-out clause from his service to the gods. The goddess of wisdom points him in the direction of Athens, where he's finally tasked with defeating Ares. Kratos arrives at Athens and meets the Oracle, who vows to help Kratos defeat the rampaging god of war by pointing him towards the one ancient MacGuffin that will actually help defeat a god, Pandora's Box. Kratos learns from Athena that the box can be found in the Temple of Pandora, which, naturally, is located in one of the most ridiculously isolated spots you can find, atop the Titan Kronos, who is cursed to wander a desert for eternity. 
Kratos, not one to back down to an insurmountable challenge, ventures to the temple, which is far from the cheeriest place in ancient Greece, and becomes the first mortal to ever reach Pandora's box. So, you think you can conquer the temple of the gods, do you? It's never been done, you know. A fact that Ares seemingly clues into the moment it happens, and from right bang in the middle of the destruction he's wreaking in Athens, Ares lobs a javelin-shaped column all the way to wherever the hell the Temple of Pandora is, and scores a bullseye right in the middle of Kratos' chest. I mean, you gotta respect that coordination. A platoon of harpies turn up and escort the box back to Ares, while Kratos slowly bleeds out in the company of the memories of his wretched life. And so Kratos dies. Instead of bringing this timeline to a close, however, the Ghost of Sparta plunges deep down into the underworld yet again, but this time he's meant to be there. His trip is incredibly brief. He literally climbs his way out on a handy rope that appears before his eyes courtesy of a mysterious gravedigger back in Athens, as that's how death works in this fantasy version of ancient Greece, I guess. Anyway, for the convenience of the story, Kratos is exactly back where he needs to be. He finds Ares screaming at the sky, cursing Zeus for his part in creating Kratos. Zeus! And for this insolence, Zeus gifts Kratos with a timely thunderbolt, which he flings right at the God of War, making him drop Pandora's box. And when opened, aside from containing all the horrible shit like plagues and death that myths tell us were in the box, Kratos simply turns into a giant version of himself. So he can go mano a mano with Ares. And not one to be outdone, Ares turns into a... spider? Um, okay, uh, after Ares tortures Kratos with more visions of his dead wife and child, the game turns into a full-on side-on fighting game, complete with health bars and everything. It's awesome. Kratos eventually wins the fight and sends a giant sword right through the God of War. Which means I can mark you off, OG God of War. So, Ares dies and blows up like an ancient Greek nuke, which rids Kratos of his nemesis, but not of the horrible memories plaguing his mind. Despite his deeds, the gods wipe Kratos' sinful slate clean, but leave him with his nightmares. At his wit's end, Kratos seeks release by flinging himself from atop a cliff overlooking the Aegean. But the gods even interfere in this act, instead raising him up to Olympus itself to take the vacant seat as the god of war. Right, we're back at the present timeline parts of Ghost of Sparta, which sees the new god of war racked with visions of his long dead family. Or so he thought. On the whim of a vision about his dead mother, Kratos travels to the Temple of Poseidon in the mythical city of Atlantis, fights off a giant sea monster, has a reunion with his dear old mum, and learns that his brother Deimos is still alive. And that's all within the first hour of the game. And shit just gets weirder. As his mum is about to tell Kratos who his dad is, no Jerry Springer DNA tests here lads, she turns into a hideous monster and Kratos has to kill her. <laughs> On his way to find his brother, Kratos kills Arenis, the daughter of death, disembowels a giant lion, and fights himself as a kid, uh, as you do. And we're still only halfway through this mad game. This is all before he encounters and subsequently murders Midas. Yep, the... Man with a Midas touch. And for all these trials and tribulations, it turns out that Kratos has to trudge all the way back to Atlantis to find his brother. Ah, video games. Never change. Kratos travels to the Domain of Death and finally discovers his brother chained up. Naturally, Deimos is pretty pissed at being left for dead by Kratos, and he nearly beats the Ghost of Sparta to within an inch of his life. Get up! Fight me! Before he's carried off by the personification of death, Thanatos, who's rightly pretty pissed off himself that Kratos killed his daughter. Long story short, Kratos saves his brother from falling into the depths of hell, and the Spartan brothers team up to literally kill death. Because if you can, why not? Deimos doesn't make it through the fight though, and after burying his brother's body, Kratos departs through the gates of Olympus. Next up on our timeline is the mobile game God of War Betrayal. Remember that one? Because I sure as hell didn't. Either way, Betrayal sees Kratos turning his back on the gods and helping the Spartans to wage war across Greece. And naturally, for a 15-year-old mobile game, there's not a whole deal of meaningful narrative content. You see, Kratos goes from screen left to screen right, hacking and slashing to his heart's content until Zeus goes, hang on lad, all this death and destruction's a bit much. And when Zeus tells you that, you know you've gone too far. As the franchise's first true sequel kicks into gear, Kratos is in full God of War mode, rampaging around roads like he owns the place. He doesn't. For this mild indiscretion, he's stripped of his godly powers by Athena, the god that helped him get set up in Olympus in the first place. 
As is always the case with the Greek deities, the gods don't always see eye to eye, hence why Zeus gifts Kratos with the blade of Olympus to rectify Athena's mistake. Kratos, the stubborn fool that he is, looks this gift horse in the mouth and declines, so Zeus kills him. Rest, you continue to defy me. This is what, the second, maybe third time he's died? I'm beginning to lose count. He is rescued by the physical embodiment of the titan Gaia, put simply, the Greek Mother Earth, and she vows to aid Kratos in seeking revenge on Zeus by helping him change his fate. Her plan to do this, have Kratos visit the actual, literal fates, and convince them to change reality. The winged horse Pegasus turns up for narrative convenience, and whisks Kratos away to the land of the titans, where Kratos bumps into Prometheus, the lad who was punished by Zeus for giving fire to mankind. Kratos puts the poor titan out of his misery, and this act of mercy imbues him with the power of the titans, somehow. These ashes will give you great strength, Kratos. Take them within you, and use this strength to defeat your enemies. Pegasus swings on by to continue Kratos' tour of Greek mythology. Next stop, the island of creation. The home of the Sisters of Fate. There atop the Steeds of Time. Yeah, everything sounds epic in God of War. He encounters the legendary hero Theseus, who he promptly kills. Because that's the established formula for these games at this point. On his way to the fates, Kratos meets friends old and new, namely the resurrected barbarian king and Perseus, both of whom die. Then he uses the wings of Icarus, who also dies, just FYI, to fly the last distance to the sisters, only to end up in the depths of hell chatting to the titan Atlas, who regales Kratos with the story of the great war between the gods and the titans. After that quick history lesson, Atlas eventually deposits Kratos exactly where he needs to be. On his continued quest to seek out the fates, Kratos learns about Zeus's sacking of Sparta, tussles with the actual Kraken, and flies a phoenix right into the fates' penthouse suite. And naturally, he doesn't just have a polite chat with the fates. He fights them. This leads to a scene with some pretty neat Back to the Future Part 2 vibes, where Kratos has to make sure the events at the end of the original God of War take place before he, yeah, you guessed it, kills the fates. Kratos finds his thread of destiny and is able to travel back in time to the pivotal moment where Zeus killed him, thus changing his fate. Just as he's about to kill Zeus, Athena intervenes and gets stabbed instead. And now I can cross you off. The story comes to a close with Kratos travelling back in time to the great war between gods and titans, and recruiting Gaia and co to take the fight to Olympus. And the game then ends on a right proper cliffhanger, with the titans arriving at the gates of Olympus ready for round two. Zeus, your son has returned! I bring the destruction of Olympus! And it's that cliffhanger that God of War 3's magnificently epic opening pays off, and then some. It's a full-on clash of the titans, as the gods of Olympus defend their territory from their predecessors. And the first key battle is land versus water, as Poseidon, god of the oceans, takes on Gaia. Kratos, caught in the middle of it all, notches up Poseidon as the first casualty among the gods by just, um, well... <laughs> Gosh, this is just the beginning of the carnage in this game. Smelling victory, Kratos and Gaia go for the head of the snake, Zeus, only for the head honcho to smite them all the way back down Mount Olympus, sending Kratos right to the realm of Hades. There, Kratos bumps into a now immortal Athena, now living life in some higher existence, her words, not mine, and she directs Kratos to seek out the flame of Olympus to help bring about the destruction of Zeus. While in the realm of the dead, Kratos drops in on a couple more gods, Hephaestus, the god of fire and forges, and Hades, the god of the underworld himself, who Kratos kills, just for giggles I guess at this point, by ripping his soul right out of his body. Yeah, that's you dead as well. Hades' death naturally brings about the total collapse of the underworld, and Kratos escapes topside to the city of Olympia, where he re-enters the fray, aiding in the takedown of Helios, god of the sun. Yeah, that was a bit much. I guess the rest of the game takes place at night then. 
As he continues on his quest to find the flame, Kratos happens across the wisecracking Hermes, the messenger of the gods, who just does not stop talking. <laughs> Kill any family members lately? After discovering that his path to success once again lies with Pandora's box, Kratos shuts up Hermes once and for all by dismembering his legs and nicking his speedy sandals. <laughs> Kratos then plays an ancient Greek version of Guitar Hero to access the flame of Olympus, and that's a sentence I never thought I'd say out loud. As he continues to search for Pandora, Kratos comes across Hera, the goddess of women, marriage and fertility, and long-suffering wife of Zeus, who pits Kratos against his half-brother Hercules, who's naturally a bit hurt at not being Zeus's favourite. This mad soap opera ends the only way it ever was going to, with Hercules pummeled into a bloody pulp. From here, Kratos travels back to Hephaestus to seek help in finding his daughter Pandora in Daedalus' labyrinth. Hephaestus agrees to help Kratos and send him off to find a precious stone with which to forge a worthy weapon. This results in Kratos coming face to face with the Titan Kronos once again, which doesn't end well for Kronos. Or Hephaestus it seems. As Kratos can clearly smell bullshit and doesn't take kindly to being sent on suicide missions by giant gods. Time to cross both of them off the board. Gosh, we are running out of gods. No way, add one more. Right, let's just take stock of where we're at because I think most everybody is dead except for, yep, Zeus and Gaia. So, Kratos finds Pandora, they open the box which sacrifices the poor lass, and things come to a head with a climactic battle atop Mount Olympus, where Kratos and Gaia fight Zeus to the death, which results in Gaia getting stabbed in the heart and Zeus literally getting meleeed to death in a hideous first person view where the screen literally just gets covered in blood. And with that, my Greek board of gods and titans is complete. And God of War 3 ends with Kratos looking out over the chaos he has wrought across the Grecian lands. And with the not Athena begging for his power, Kratos finally ends his suffering by impaling himself on the blade of Olympus. Only, we're not at the end of this mad mythological tragedy just yet, as is teased in a very ambiguous sting at the end of the credits, a teaser that wasn't fulfilled for nearly a decade with the release of... Yes, out with the old and in with the Norse. I'm gonna need a new board. So it turns out Kratos' destruction of the Greek world was localised, hence why there's still life here in the freezing north, where a seemingly immortal god of war has settled. A century has passed since Kratos' war in Olympus, and the ghost of Sparta has seemingly mellowed a tad. He has settled down in the realm of Midgard, and has married a woman called Fay, and together they have a son called Atreus, a son who has no clue who or what his father really is. But as this is God of War, this happy life is not to last long, as the 2018 flavour of God of War opens with Kratos cremating the body of his wife before being thrown into an almighty battle with a stranger that has suspiciously godlike powers. After seemingly winning this earth-shattering battle, Kratos and Atreus vow to scatter Fae's ashes at the top of the highest peak in the Nine Realms. And from an incredibly simplistic perspective, that's basically the entire plot of the game. But obviously, a lot more actually happens amidst this father and son pilgrimage. First off, there's the mysterious Witch of the Woods who aids them on their journey, and Kratos immediately cottons onto the fact that there's something godly about her. Then there's this absolute mad lad Mimir, who helps the pair get ahead in the game. I'm so sorry. He instructs the pair that the highest peak is actually located in Jotunheim, and then asks Kratos to behead him, and take his head to be resurrected by the Witch of the Woods. Yeah. Oh, I can't watch this. Once revived, he reveals that the witch is actually the goddess Freya, wife to Odin and mother to Thor, Balder, etc. They have a lot of kids. While he's incredibly reluctant to trust her, Kratos allows Freya to aid them in their quest, and as they continue on their merry way to Jotunheim, the father-son relationship is tested to the absolute limits. Atreus, showing flashes of his father's rage in a way that scares even Kratos, finally learns his dad's true identity, and even the true identity of his mum, Faye, too, who it turns out is actually a giant from Jotunheim, meaning that the little lad's DNA makeup is the unique mix of half-giant, quarter-god, and quarter-mortal. 
Oh, and the slightly confusing fact that his mum and the giants referred to him as Loki. Yep, more on that in the next game. The mysterious stranger from the opening is also revealed to be the god Balder, and as previously mentioned, the son of Freya. Attempting to break the cycle of violence perpetrated by Balder, who is intent on murdering his mother, Kratos steps in and snaps Balder's neck. Freya, who is ready to die at the hands of her petulant son, then vows revenge on Kratos for murdering Balder. Oh hey, that's another god to tick off my new board. Bye bye Balder. All of that brings us to the conclusion of the game that sees Kratos and Atreus finally make it to the tallest peak in the Nine Realms and scatter Fae's ashes. And with that, I guess the pair can finally get some peace and quiet. Well, no. Upon their return to Midgard, Mimir informs them that the three year long Fimble winter has begun which eventually leads to a little something called Ragnarok, the literal end of the Norse world. Oh, for fu- Yeah, here we go again. Not a lot is known just yet about the narrative of God of War Ragnarok, but the key fact that we do know is that it takes place three years later at the tail end of Fimblewinter, meaning that Ragnarok is right around the corner. Hence the title, I guess. The game's story will focus on Kratos and Atreus' attempts to prevent Ragnarok, while also searching for answers as to why Atreus was referred to as Loki by the giants of Jotunheim. Oh, and there's also the small matter of the introduction of Thor, the god of thunder, and the reintroduction of Freya, both of which are out for revenge on Kratos for various reasons. And I'm sure I'll be striking a few more gods off my big old board, so look forward to that I guess. And that, pals, is the God of War timeline fully explained. I'll be doing a deeper dive into the story of the 2018 God of War in a future video, so if you want a refresher before going into Ragnarok, make sure to subscribe for that. Thanks a lot for watching guys, I'll see you next time.